uh, Josh Cowan, and I play viola. Good. How long have you been playing viola? Uh, since sixth grade, so 25, 30 years. Yeah, okay. And why did you, why did you start? I lost count. Yeah, why did you stay yeah, well? Why did you start playing viola? Um, I had an opportunity after my fourth grade year to take a summer school class. Um, I had already been taking piano lessons for about four years, and um, I had a really good experience. And well, let me ask. Let's go back a step or two. Why did you study piano? Yeah. What got you into music? Um, my parents gave my brother and I both opportunities to experience a lot of different things. My mother and my aunt um, have both been uh, pianists. And so my mother started us on, my brother and I on piano uh, first grade. Wow. And I took to it really well. Um, I enjoyed it. I had a really good teacher my first um, couple years of studying piano. Fantastic, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, when it comes from the right place, it, it makes such a difference. You know? And then if you Definitely. change instrument, that's fine. But, you know, it's, uh, <laughs> it's that passion, that passion. Of yes. Music. Well, it's interesting. I've looked at your CV, and um, it's fascinating. So you went to um, uh, Truett Theological Seminary, and then yes. uh, uh, Clinton for a residency, and then to Candler here in, at Emory, Candler School of Theology. What brought you along this path? Um, it was more of a desire to discover. Um, I kind of had a crisis of faith um, after teaching for a few years, uh, right out of college. Um, uh, most of it was dealing around my sexual orientation and what I grew up in, very conservative Baptist um, tradition. And uh, what I began studying began opening me up more and more. I originally was thinking about a church music career hmm. and the suggestion was to, because I already had a music degree, to uh, go the ministry route. Um, I would get more of an experience of the the spirituality and the and the history and the background and also the pastoral education. Fascinating. Did you continue yeah. or have you continued in either the <laughs> um, uh, the church music side or, and or the ministerial side? Sure. So right out of seminary, I joined a Mennonite church farm over in East Atlanta, okay. and I was a resident there for about four years. Um, and part of that, I did music in worship and also worked with the kids uh, doing Sunday school. Um, I've played for, been hired for various church gigs in the community. Um, and have also, I'm also a member of Oakhurst Baptist Church and have done some work with them, done music with the youth there, as well as... Um, co-led uh, planning and leading music and worship for the youth camp that um, that church is involved with um, during the summers. Oh, that's really nice. And so you, yeah. you really enjoy working with the younger people. Yeah. Yeah, that's fabulous. What, uh, what is your main profession now? <laughs> um, I am focusing on my private lesson studio. Mm -hmm. Good. Um, and uh, I have a cashiering job that supports me in that role. <laughs> mm -hmm. Sure. And, and then a few years ago, I um, began studying a spiritual direction program. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll be picking that up again soon. Um, I'm looking at combining spirituality with um, music. Um, in some form, and exploring uh, the intersections with that and, and how my <laughs> uh, talents and uh, training can be best used um, in that way. Well, I think that's fascinating. What, what um, I imagine you've worked on this 
you know, either directly or indirectly for many years. Well, where do you, where do you want to go with that? That, uh, I mean, to, you know, to use music in a, I mean, in a spiritual quote unquote way. I mean, we go back to Bach and, and of course, even earlier with Gregorian chants and so on. What, um, what's your thought now about where, where it should go? Yeah, I see more intentionality in connecting spirituality with music. Um, music has been used as a way of expression, um, feeling spirituality, um, and processing those feelings and thought. Um, so developing a way for people to either utilize the artistic experiences they already have or creating new connections um, through various art forms to bring about, um, to help bring up issues, to process through those, and then find a way to um, release and um, be creative um, through that process. We all know that we transform um, negative feelings and behaviors by turning those into positive uh, actions and reactions. And so helping people to navigate the, that process of taking something that's been negative um, or not so helpful and turning it into something positive and transformative. There are a lot of layers there I'm thinking about, and that is, you know, <laughs> um, I mean, from the, you know, the historical with Bach and Beethoven with the Requiems and and so on, and uh, Foray, I mean, one of the leading ones, uh, in my opinion. Yes. Um, but, and that is sort of taking a spiritual content and then interpreting it musically. But yes. I think there's also the, the experience of playing music, which can be a spiritual experience, a shared community experience. Yes. You know. I specifically think of uh, Taze services. Mm-hmm. Exactly, yeah. exactly. And uh, yeah, and I think, I think the idea of community is what, at least for me, really is so important about, you know, our orchestra, the Atlanta Musicians Orchestra. It, it's become yes. a family and, uh, you know, um, we're, we're really in quite a position of having a very harmonious knock on wood family. <laughs> and, uh, um, <laughs> quite a loving family, I, I find it. And, you know, musicians can be competitive, um, but mm -hmm. um, I, I find that our group is very generous, one with the other, and, um, and across sections and so on. What, what, how did you come to the AMO? My first orchestra connection in Atlanta was the Atlanta Philharmonic Orchestra. And it's through those members um, that ha already had connection with Atlanta Musicians Orchestra, um, specifically Mayro, um, and then Amy Wilson has also had connection, and I found Marilyn Pipkin right. um, have all been uh, part of AMO. And I came to a concert, I guess it's two years ago now, um, and enjoyed the concert. And I, you talk about community because it was really the feel of the people when I walked in the space, mm -hmm. of noticing the interaction and um, the musicality of the pieces. I, it was um, a level that I really appreciated and respected. Um, and so I decided, uh, you asked me to come and sit in for a rehearsal, and the, especially the viola section, which is so warm and welcoming. Um, uh, us as musicians, you're right, we can be very territorial and protective uh, our, of our spaces and our positions. Um, and I did not feel that at all yeah. from them. And that was very encouraging. Yeah, I, I find it quite a unique section you run too. rehearsal? Sorry? Oh, yeah. And I love the way that you run rehearsal. Oh. Um, the way that you take input from um, the people and are aware of of just musical dynamics that are going on, um, uh, personal um, relations. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, you have to, um, or you don't have to, but you know, what's the purpose <laughs> of having? 
you know, basically an amateur or semi-professional orchestra, if, if you're going to be, you know, ruling like a, a dictator, it doesn't, in this day and age, and uh, probably any time, it doesn't uh, make sense. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and the feedback is so great. And, you know, we tease each other, but we also really work together. And everything from Boeings to, you know, attendance to, to getting new people to whatever. Um, yeah. You know, I'm, I'm really pleased with them. And I'm so pleased you joined us. I hope you'll continue to when we get out of this quarantine situation. Well, it's funny, we we're talking about the family of the AMO, and I was looking at your resume, and, uh, you know, obviously you've been dealing in the ministerial sense with very diverse people with, and bringing them, you know, to, to self-awareness, but also to, uh, to form what we were talking about earlier, to form a community. And uh, it's not an easy task, um, but it's a satisfying one when it happens, you know? Absolutely. <laughs> and, uh, do you use music in your um, ministerial work too? Uh, yes. Um, so indirectly, um, I the uh, I have a friend um, who she and I have kind of started a um, music outreach mm-hmm. program. Um, and so we have, it's, it's mostly through personal connections of people that we know that are in retirement communities, assisted living, um, even one that's been in a hospice situation, um, that we can go and just either play music or um, sing along with, play along with um, people who are in more confined, limited, difficult situations. Um, and I um, have been coordinating a group class because I have a lot of adult students who are um, not trained enough to join um, as a, a community orchestra yet, but still need an ensemble to play. And so my goal has been to provide performance opportunities for them and ministerial experience for um for other people to take them around to similar places and um, just provide some some music. And one of the things that my friend Sue and I do, in addition to just go and play music, is building those connections, interacting with the people, checking in with them, um, providing background about our experience with music and make, helping them make connections of um, how music is beneficial, bringing those things to a forefront of awareness for them. And oftentimes we get responses or requests of, I really like this piece because it helps me in this way. It makes me remember these things um, or or connects with me in this way. Um, So building not only connections with people, but connections with music um, in helpful ways. No, that's fabulous. You know, at the um, Bremen where we rehearse, I've often heard people say, I mean, one lady, bless her heart, uh, after one concert took my hand and in hers and she said, you know, it reminds me of my days in London, listening to the London uh, <laughs> Symphony Orchestra. And I thought, yeah, okay, <laughs> that was a lovely compliment, you know, but it does, it triggers these memories and this joyful... Uh, connection and you know and pieces of music trigger memories anyway uh, and, yes you know, in these retirement homes or you know where people are not as connected to the world it's uh, I think it's a real gift to do that and you know for us we're lucky because we can do our first concert you know at, at the Bremen and all our rehearsals so you know we have our set of you know people who follow us uh, continuously and mm-hmm. it's, it's wonderful and we, yeah. I don't think we've had one concert where we have not literally run out of room for seating, you know, uh, there. I've noticed that. It's, it's wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> you know. And I love, I love that connection. Um, I think that's a beautiful arrangement um, to have with that space. I, I, it's great that they had that space that the AMO can rehearse and perform in there and then to provide that for them um, some entertainment, some music, some connection, 
and for their community building. It is beautiful. I love it. Yeah, it's, it is really a gift for us and, and hopefully for them too. Well, speaking yeah. of, of the music, I, I've heard that you maybe have an in, interesting instrument or uh, what, tell me about your viola. <laughs> um, I, I don't know how interesting it is. Okay. Um, oh, oh, I, <laughs> I think people are, are thinking about my, the tailpiece that I have. Mm -hmm. Um, it is a, um, I, I can't even pronounce the name of the maker. It's F R I R Z. Um, and it's, uh, do you want me to get it? Yeah. Maybe easier yeah, to see. Sure. <laughs> okay. So, this is the, the tailpiece, and um, again, the maker's name is F-R-I-R-Z. You can see how it's shaped differently. That it's closer to the bridge and the fingerboard on the higher string on the A string side, and further away on the lower string, the C string side. Mm. Um, what this does is provides more length on the side of the bridge to balance out the string length, or the... Um, sorry, the, the tone of the string on this side. So the lower strings have longer wavelengths, bigger wavelengths, and by making the string longer on this side, it balances out the harmonics, or the overtones yeah, that yeah. Um, resonate from the open string. The other thing that it does is it has, it's actually um, twisted, so it provides more tension hmm. on the lower string and also provides the more um, hold, more grip, uh, more contact for the lower string. So, and where yeah. did you where did you uh, come across it? How did you learn about it? <laughs> I was I was actually looking for um, uh, photo clips online uh, to put on a website that I'm building for myself, and came across a picture of this and was like, "That's really odd. What is that?" And so I, I just read about it and um, decided, hey, I'll try it. And they, you know, they're very open to marketing, promoting it. So they had a, a like a thirty day guarantee or something. I put it on um, and immediately noticed the difference in the resonance of the instrument and was like, oh, this is great. <laughs> um, and it, it it sells itself. Uh, people notice it right away. Um, I'm like, what is that? And so I tell them about it. Um, it's also quite lovely yeah. too to look at to the side. It's beautiful. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, you know, overtones, that's what it's all about, really. And uh, Yes. You know, it's a uh, it's a whole a whole discipline to study, but uh, you know, musicians can hear it and uh, and adapt to it differently. And you know, again, going back to the yes. community, you know, you have you know, overtones between different musicians and uh, mm -hmm different instruments and uh, the acoustics and uh, it's um, for me it also speaks to my spiritual side about resonating right. with people um, and it, people talk about auras and um, and and, um, and lights and, and things and mm -hmm. and I see that in a very similar way and so that's one of my other connections between spirituality and music is this sense of resonance mm -hmm. um, so where do you where do you see yourself going in the next few years so what sort of direction, what kind of path? Yeah, um, you know, the whole COVID thing put <laughs> a lot of things on hold. Um, and uh, it, it's been a lot of kind of reworking my life to, I'm just kind of in stasis mode at the moment. Um, I want to get a better handle on um, private students building the studio. Um, I, I will admit, um, my undergrad in music education was good in general, um, but the string pedagogy side was quite lacking. Um, I, I've done okay over the years, um, but I feel um, not as knowledgeable as I would like to be. And so I've done some self-educating to help better myself and, and get myself on a better track. Um, I. I am lucky, fortunate that my students love me, <laughs> um, and they and they endure a lot um, of, of some of my what I see as my shortcomings. But um, so I'm I'm working on 
building a better practice for myself. Um, and now that I've kind of decided, it's something that I really want to pursue. Um, and so getting that to a level where it's more self-sustaining, um, that I won't have to have other things that I have to do to support it. Um, because the goal is to come back to the spiritual direction program um, to explore that in a deeper sense and really start planning out how I'm going to integrate the music and the spirituality together. Yeah, that's fine. The lifelong goal. <laughs> it's uh, yeah. never ending. Yeah, it's <laughs> fabulous. So, but are you teaching virtually right now? I am. Good. All my students are virtual right now. Um, and it's meant a lot of uh, learning how to teach differently <laughs> since I can't reach out and physically manipulate people. Um, and then, the, you know, the whole internet connection thing, you know, the delays and all, yeah. finding appropriate moments to say, okay, let's, let's go back here. Right. Um, right. And then it's also th this whole playing along with people um, has really been suspended. And I first encountered it with a couple of my school students, school age students, and so what I did is I um, there's an app called an application called Acapella, it allows you to record multiple voices, and so I just recorded all the parts and um, invited them to collaborate with me, and so they get to go in and replace themselves um, with one of the parts and and play along <laughs> with. So it's still not the same, no, but at least no. it's something that they get to interact with. It reminds me of the old recordings when I was a youngster of, you know, um, they were called something like All But One, and they were like a piano uh -huh. concerto without the pianist, and you could play. <laughs> it's like, yeah. But, and it, you know, and what you were saying about the tactile part, I mean, really, every teacher I've had is just, whether it's piano or conducting, it's really you know, grab my arms, grab my hands, grab my shoulders, you know. And it's it's really it's it's important, you know. It's part of it. Yeah. Shown me something or what have you, um, but you know, God willing, it'll all come back. But uh, so. it's it's been a long stretch. What, what's your favorite yeah. music period? Uh, Baroque. Baroque, yeah. 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 Any special Definitely. composer you're more in love with than others? Or? Um, Bach is probably my favorite composer. Um, for a lot of different reasons. Um, I, again, talking about resonance, I love deep, rich harmonies. Uh, I think Bach does that in a lot of different ways. Um, interestingly, one of my favorite pieces of all time, at least my favorite string piece, is the, um, the Barber's Adagio for strings. Yeah. Oh, that's a... just love the progression of, of resonances, the tensions and releases in all of those. Uh, you know, Barbara is gorgeous, but yes, Bach is you know, <laughs> sine qua non, you know, it's <laughs> just incredible. I, uh, I had the joy of conducting a concert in New Zealand, and we did a lot, we did the double concerto by Mendelssohn, we did other wow. pieces, but um, the real, I, I don't know, maybe the highlight for me was a very short three-minute piece um, by Mozart called the Ave Verum Corpus. Have you heard? Oh, of love Ave Verum. Oh, yes. It's just, it's just sort of perfection. <laughs> yes. Um, I've gotten to do that a handful of times in various ways. Um, uh, the first was actually played um, as part of a string quartet for my choir in high school. Nice. Um, they did a performance of that, and it was beautiful. And then when I was in Houston, the church choir did it first with organ accompaniment, and then when we got a few more string players, we did the same accompaniment, the string quartet accompaniment with the Ave Verum. Yeah. It's stunning, yeah. isn't it? Just the, yeah, every time I hear it, even now, it gives me the chills. It's just beautiful. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. Well, let me ask you, what's... Um, What's your favorite sound? Mm -hmm. uh, as far as instruments? No, anything, any kind of sound. Oh. 
I love I love bells and specifically like tubular bells. Um, I remember growing up, um, early childhood, we had a wind chime that had, at, at least at that age, that seemed like very large tubular bells on it, and just love to sit where I could hear them um, when the wind blows, especially during the rain. Um, and in fact, I fall asleep to a, a CD that um, has tubular bells with it's like a rainforest and um, uh, some sort of Indian flute in the background as well. And it's something about that combination that makes so much at ease. Oh, that's lovely. Yeah. yeah. Uh, what's your least favorite noise? Oh, um, uh, it. it Interestingly, um, it's probably human babble. <laughs> well said. Um, people talking just to hear themselves talk, um, or it just there's something about that. It's not just the sound; it's the feeling behind it. Um, that people are feeling so distressed that they need to act it out in such a um, aggressive way, passive aggressive way. Um, and so it, yeah, it creates a feeling for me. Um, it's my need to help, but, um, there's also that, that passiveness that says, I don't want help. <laughs> I'm just going to express myself. So it's that combination of, of putting something out and also creating a wall at the same time that just, yeah, um, get some nerves. That's fascinating. I'm, I'm glad that never happens in politics. Um. <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, well, what are you reading now? Um, I'm reading a few different things. Um, so for, well, it can all be pleasure and in, enlightenment. Um, I love books that are in a series. Um, and there is, I mean, I forget the official name of the series, but, um, you can call it the skin map series. Hmm. Um, it's about, uh, a man who, um, is, has discovered lay travel. And so travels through time and space. And then there's, um, there's a whole kind of society and, exploring and then there's people who want to use this discovery for other purposes and people who are trying to protect it and promote um, the advancement of, of the human race um, and then I'm also reading um, uh, um, it's a book on, on emotional intelligence mm -hmm. um, it's a book that I've kind of <laughs> been more uh, Several years, the importance of recognizing this other side of us. You know, everybody talks about intelligence, um, uh, uh, mental intelligence, and um, recognizing and owning the emotional intelligence that I have as well. Um, yeah, those are probably the two primary um, sets of books that I'm reading. Fascinating. What, what about music? Where, what are you working on musically for yourself? Um, in rebuilding a basis of um, good pedagogy, of revisiting a lot of um, exercises. Since I don't have orchestra music to prepare for, I'm going back to a lot of the former techniques. Um, the technical exercises that I learned early on and exploring further, just paying more attention to all the elements that are involved um, and letting myself feel those um, as a more experienced player, but thinking as a new player. Um, how do I experience these and what, what am I doing? I'm also revisiting um, earlier concertos as well. Um, I for some reason, I love the Telemann viola concerto. I just, um, it's from that Baroque period. 
um, and you know, it's contemporary with Bach, um, very similar, um, and it's probably it's the first concerto like most violists that I learned. Um, I love sharing that one. Oh, it's marvelous! It's marvelous. I am. Um, I've never um, taken opportunities to travel overseas, and that's something that I is on my bucket list is to visit old churches that were specifically either specifically built for um, musical performances or the composers use specifically those spaces to write and compose and have pieces performed. Um, yeah. Um, like my head knows it when I hear certain pieces. Mm -hmm. I, I, I even tell other people, this is what was all, all going on. So we need to make it sound like this. Um, but to go there and experience it myself, yeah. to be just like that icing on the cake. You would love it. You would love it. Keep, yeah. keep, keep working towards it. It's worth it. Yeah. A little pilgrimage, you know. Um, yes. Yeah, they'd be great. Well, let me ask you, um, I don't know if you've heard the other interviews, but let me ask you, um, assuming there's a heaven, uh, what would you like St. Peter or God to say to you when you got to the pearly gates? Um, I think I would like to hear an acknowledgement of um, both the things, the, the shortcomings in my life to, to recognize those, the humanity of me, the humanness of myself, um, and then to also recognize that those places where I made efforts to overcome those, um, I would, I would, <laughs> I expect to have some sort of conversation of, wow, you really could have done better in these places. These are some really big missed opportunities. And this is maybe how life may have turned out differently. Um, if you had done these things, um, and these are some of the beautiful things, some of the beautiful outcomes that happen because of these other choices that you made. Yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah. No, that's beautiful. I mean, you know, we can't make every choice. And what is a right choice? You know, I mean, each one leads to a different absolutely. path. And, uh, you know, we don't know quite what, what the right one is. Or if indeed there is a right one. I mean, there are often wrong ones. Right. But uh, even the wrong ones, you know, may lead us down. <laughs> You know, to the place yeah. that we need to be. Yeah, that's marvelous. Josh, yeah. thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Dr. Lund. I appreciate it. And I, I miss you and yeah. the orchestra. And uh, as I said earlier, I'm, I'm very grateful for your participation. I, I really, thank you. I really am grateful. And, uh, you know, thank you. I would, uh, anyway, maybe we can think of eventually doing. Uh, one of the viola concerti, if you're interested. Um, let me see. Absolutely. Let's see. That would be a, a great honor. Absolutely. Uh, so. For me, too. Uh, you know, I don't play <laughs> much Baroque music because it cuts out so many players, especially brass and, you know, some brass, some winds, you know, and so on. But um, anyway, maybe yeah. we could do a special concert. Uh, we'll see how that goes. Awesome. Keep, keep nudging <laughs> me. Cool. <laughs> All, All right. the best, my friend. You yes. take care and thank well, you. Well, thank you. And thank you for doing this. Uh, it it's, it's, means a lot. Thank you. Yeah. I appreciate it. All right. <laughs> Be well. All right. Okay. Take care. Take care.